not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, sing it out. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have an incredible service today, opportunity to be able to worship the Lord and continue to grow in who we are in Him. Um, hey, if you're joining us online, thank you as well for continuing to partner with us and continuing to dive in and give God the opportunity to be able to speak to you and to your heart uh, from His Word uh, as we continue on. Uh, if it's your first time, we have a text service that we would love to be able to get some information from you um, and give you some information uh, about us as well. 
Um, you can text the word guest to the number that you see on the uh, screen behind me, and you'll be able to uh, you know, get the information uh, about us, and we can send you some information as well. There's several different keywords you can text if you want information on who we are and that kind of stuff as well prayer requests and things that we have going on. So um, Wednesday at the cross, uh, we cranked it up, started last week. And so we would love for you guys to jump in and to join us. We have several different intentional tracks. We do a teaching time and then we've got uh, financial classes going on with the Dave Ramsey. We have um, a Spanish speaking group that we've started. Um, we've got a leadership track. We've got a men's group, a D group and a ladies D group as well. So we'd love for you guys to jump in. If you haven't seen it, we've got uh, the Bible app. Um, and it's uh, a, a great app, as you guys can tell when you come in. You're not getting a piece of paper anymore with a bulletin. All of the announcements, all of Tim's notes, now today Nick's notes are online because we're going to have the opportunity to be able to hear from Nick today as he shares the word. And so I know that we're all excited about that. So um, another thing that's coming up is on the 30th, we'll be having Face Down Worship um, that's going to be Wednesday the 30th. It'll be a great night of worship. We'll be together in here. So starting today at 5 p.m., we have Divorce Care that will be led by the Klotfelters. Um, it's an incredible um, support group and a teaching time uh, for anybody who's gone through just uh, divorce and, and wants to walk through some healing through that. I want to really strongly encourage you to, to go by the Connect Center and sign up in the back. Um, and give the clock filters the opportunity to be able to meet you as well. That'll start today here on campus at 5 p.m. Thank you for your continued generosity and your support. Um, a couple of updates just real quick. We had some great conversation with our partners who are in Iraq. Um, we have, we've been partnered with them for a couple of years. I've been going over for five or six years now. And uh, they have been in the northern area, the region of Kurdistan for the last several years. And so when ISIS came in, that was the region where um, there was a lot of turmoil going on. And so it was really, really cool to see how God placed them there and has given them an opportunity to go into so many refugee camps, to be able to share and to see so many come to know Christ. From there, these people are now moving back into their homes, into their villages and rebuilding. And what's cool is that as they're rebuilding, they're setting up Hey, this place here, our house will be a house of worship. And it's incredible to be able to see the way that God is working. They're also getting ready to adopt a five-year-old little girl whose parents were killed by ISIS when they came in. And so it's an incredible opportunity for this family uh, to continue to grow and to develop. We would ask for you to pray for this as we continue to support them. Uh, their team and their leadership has come to them and asked them to start expanding over the entire country of Iraq. Um, and so now he's going and doing strategic um, meetings all over the country and setting up uh, different um, independent organizations to be able to do ministry all over the country. And it's because of your faithfulness, because of God's faithfulness, it's opened up doors to be able to continue to do incredible ministry in a very, very difficult area. Um, as along with that, just down the street, we have the opportunity to work with Shepherd staff. Um, Ronnie um, is, is leading our global outreach here. Ronnie is getting ready to um, open up and talk with them about doing a Saturday that we um, as a church family would be able to help out and to partner with them. We'd have about 30 volunteers to do a food service day on a Saturday all together. Ronnie's working with them and get some more information. And so be praying for us as we continue to look on ways that we can reach out right here in Loganville, all the way across the world to the ends of the earth. So thank you for your continued generosity. Let's pray and we'll dive into Ephesians. Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to seek after who you are to do the things you call us to do as a fellowship. I pray that you would just continue to give us uh, just wisdom in knowing how to best do so. I pray that you will continue to help us to be able to see and to know how we can best live our lives for you. Uh, speak to us this morning through your word and give us the opportunity to be able to learn more about who you desire for each of us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'm so glad you're here to uh, dive into some of the topics that we have been talking about as we've been looking at Ephesians. Um, before I totally dive into that, I just wanted to say that um, it's very odd to play music and then come up here and speak. Um, I have like a million wires on me right now, so hopefully everything continues to work. But it was a great privilege to play today because Austin, or the guy who played drums back here, uh, was back for the first time since he had his first child. So it was just awesome. We're, he had a little baby girl, so um, we're pumped to have him back. He's my, uh, he plays with a lot of passion. He's a fun one and one of my favorite people here. So pumped to have him. I'm going to do my best to stay seated as long as possible because there's a lot of standing, playing, and speaking, but I don't talk well while sitting, so it won't last long. Um, I, even on the phone, I can't sit down. Um, so before we dive in, let's pray, and um, we're going to just seek the Lord today, seek his wisdom. Father, we, we come after you. I, I want to see you do something amazing in me today, Father, in us as Christ followers, as people who are, who are fascinated by who you are, Father, and deeply want to be transformed, God, for you to continue your work in us. You're so generous, God, that you are continually transforming us, Father, that our journey, Father, in knowing you has no end. And so, Lord, we ask today, God, that you are merciful to us in this room, God, as you've showed us mercy so many times, and that you'll be graceful with us, God, and that you will allow us to understand things, God, that are even beyond our own comprehension, Lord. We love you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this show called Fool Us. It's a Penn and Teller show. If you know Penn and Teller, they're comedian uh, magicians. I had to work really hard to say magicians because I'm a musician. Those are really close words, and I thought I was going to screw it up, but I didn't. That was worth clapping for, but you didn't know it, so it's fine. Um, so, so they're comedian magicians, and on this show, Fool Us, a magician will come into this packed theater in Las Vegas full of spectators, um, and they will perform a trick, and Penn and Teller sit in the middle of the room, and they watch it. And these are guys who've studied magic their whole lives. They have um, been students of this craft, and so they watch somebody do a trick, and if they can't figure out how they do it, the guy wins or whatever. Um, it's interesting, they, they reveal that they know how the trick is being done by telling them, like, oh, I bet you read this guy's book and you studied this one, so that the audience still can still be amazed, because the audience is baffled every time. They don't understand it, but for Penn and Teller, who sit right there, this is normal for them. Even if they're fooled, they're like, I, I have a good idea of how that was done. And my fear for us as Christians is that we've been around, especially here in the South, is that we've been around so many of these concepts and things that we no longer live a life that's amazed by the Lord. We just, it kind of becomes normal. What is totally unnormal, that you can pray and God hears you, the creator of the universe hears you and speaks with you and walks with you, becomes normal to us because we've been around it so long. All right, just ponder this for me for a moment. When I was 18 years old, Lisa and I had just got engaged and... Um, I was like, you know what, i got to move out of the house, make sure I can take care of myself before I try to take care of somebody else. It seemed wise at the moment. And so I moved into this basement apartment of these two old ladies, two fiery red-headed ladies like this tall. Okay, They lived upstairs. I lived in the basement. And I didn't have a whole lot of reason to interact with them except for if I did laundry, I had to go to their floor. Okay, And I remember one of the first times I had like, I was really trying to take responsibility for being an adult. And so I had this list of things I was going to achieve on that day. One was laundry, one was groceries, all these things, right? So I start a load of laundry. I go downstairs. I think, okay, I think I'm going to have time. I'm going to run and get groceries. And I start doing all this stuff. And I, don't, I forget about the laundry for a minute, okay? Then I'm like, oh, yeah, i got to flip that out. So I go up there to go put it in the dryer. And these ladies had already put it in the dryer and folded it and put it in one of their baskets. And it was sitting right there waiting for me. And I was like, that's pretty amazing. It's not teaching me any responsibility. I don't know if I had any plans to actually fold it. I just wanted it clean. 
you know? But that, that wasn't what I was expecting, so it was this beautiful gift, and I was, I was amazed and appreciated it. Not like a, for a single guy who lives his life by himself for a while and then ends up getting married, and his wife, let's say his wife is just like, you know what, I'm going to do your laundry every Thursday. And so every Friday, this single guy gets up, and he goes to his dresser, and he opens his underwear drawer, and there it is, full, fresh drawers. You're ready. I, I use the word draws because I think that encompasses all the flavors of underwear. All the, that's a bad terminology. All the types of underwear that you could have, that can be in there. So I don't want to leave anybody out, right? And so um, you start getting used to that. You start seeing it. The first time you're like, this is great. She's taking care of me. We're so in love. It's so good for man not to be alone. He's taking care of me. And then a couple years down the road, she takes a trip, and then you wake up on a Friday. She's been gone for a week. You open the drawer, and in there is that one pair that every guy has that you should have thrown away. <laughs> it's got holes in it. I mean, it should have been gone a long time, but at one time it was your lucky drawers. And so you don't want to throw it away even though you haven't worn it in that time, and now it's the only option. And you realize, I've taken this for granted. Let's watch a YouTube video and figure out how to do laundry right? So you can forget what becomes familiar or what is familiar becomes unfamiliar just by it happening over and over again, right? Because this is a unique gift, your laundry being done for you. It's a beautiful thing, but we can become unappreciative of it as it has happened over and over again. Imagine how different even your marriage would be if every time you open that drawer and you saw it filled back up, realized that, that was not magic, that it was somebody serving you, and you thank God for your wife. And even thanked her face to face. Because it is a gift, keeping ourselves thankful. And see, these last two weeks, we've been hitting grace real hard. And there's good reason for that. In Ephesians 1, it says you have been, God has lavished his grace upon you. I love that word, lavished, okay? Like, I don't know if you like go to Moe's or Chipotle and you're like, you know what, lavish that cheese on there. I don't know how much cheese that is, but it's a lot of cheese, right? He's lavished his grace upon you. And in Ephesians 2, it says, hey, you've been saved by grace through faith. It's not you, but it's the gift of God. So this concept of grace is absolutely amazing. And my question for you is, are you amazed by God's grace? You, know, you see it in new Christians, people who've just been traveling all kinds of sideways, and all of a sudden they intersect with the Lord, and you see this amazement in them. But for a lot of us who've grown up in Christian households and we've heard it over and over again, it starts to stale on us. So this quote got passed around around our anvil guys this week. It's from Robert Capone, an Episcopal priest, and he says, We are in a war between dullness and astonishment. The most critical issue facing Christians is not abortion, pornography, the disintegration of the family, moral absolutes, MTV, drugs, racism, sexuality, or school prayer. The critical issue today is dullness. We have lost our astonishment. The good news is no longer good news. It's okay news. Christianity is no longer changing, no, no longer life changing. It's life enhancing. Jesus doesn't change people into wild eyed radicals anymore, He changes them into nice people. What a travesty. How do we stay amazed? How do we stay so grateful for the grace that calls us back home? That says, I don't just save you, I make you my own. You're a co-heir with Christ because of the blood of my son. You see, the word grace is used 131 times in the English Standard Version of the Bible. 131 times, and 86 of those is by Paul, the writer of Ephesians. And if you know anything about Paul, this is not surprising. Paul was very 
aware of his depravity because before his intersection with Jesus, he was a persecutor and murderer of Christians. And in fact, when Jesus intersects with him on the Damascus Road, he's on his way to persecute Christians. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me, Paul? Knocks him off his feet. Causes him to lose his sight for a little while. Then Ananias comes and prays and the scales fall off his eyes. And he is amazed by the grace that has been extended to him. Because you know what he knew? He should have killed me. This is what I deserve, is death. But what he's given me is a life with purpose. I totally understand it now. And I can live in a freedom that allows me to grow the kingdom and be a part of the master plan. See, mercy is us not getting what we deserve, which in Paul's case, in our cases, is death. And grace is getting what you don't deserve getting this salvation that I have no right to. And so Paul lived his life amazed by grace. And this word deserve, we hear all over our language right now, like especially during politics, during election times, we hear people say, this is what the American people deserve. And as a Christian, I hear that and I say, Do not give me what I deserve. My whole relationship with God is based on that I get what I don't deserve. Perks my ears every time I hear a politician say that. Are you amazed by grace? Are you in awe of how God has graced you? Or do you treat this grace that has been lavished upon you as like an entitlement? because you've heard it so many times. Do we continue to abuse it instead of standing in awe and kneeling before the grace giver? Sometimes we cheapen grace. Tim talked about last week, he said, grace is free, but it's not cheap. It's very costly. And in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, he breaks down these two different views of grace He says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace, the true grace, is the treasure hidden in the field For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all he has. It is the pearl of great price by which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out his eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. The gift which must be asked for, the door which a man must knock. So do we understand this costly grace? Does it move us towards obedience, towards surrender? Are we in awe of it? A song we just sung called The Passion has this lyric in it that I'm a, I, I'm a very justice-minded guy. Like, I want the things to work out right, and this rattles me every time. It says, the innocent found guilty as the guilty one walks free. And that passes over you unless you consider it for a moment and you go, that's not really what justice looks like. That's grace. Guilty should be convicted. Innocence should walk free in the God we follow. It's the opposite. Are we amazed by the grace that God has extended to us? And grace can be a little bit confusing sometimes because Paul talks about it really in two ways. It would have almost two definitions, okay? We have this grace that we hear of undeserved favor, the grace that delivers us salvation. Um, And we see that often, like Romans 3.24 says, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In Romans 5.15, 
If many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. This is him speaking of this massive grace that the Lord has poured out that brings us to salvation. But he also talks about grace as this power for living. This right now, God pouring his grace out for us to be able to make it through a very difficult life. I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples, and we're going to dive into that thought. So 2 Corinthians 9.8, it says, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. See, this is now pouring out this grace so you may abound in every good work. As you're working towards the things of the kingdom, good work, his purposes, I'm going to help you get through that. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Jesus says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Here on this earth is where we experience weakness, and his grace is poured out to show you his power that you're not alone. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So this grace is saying, as I'm working these things, as I'm sharing the gospel, as I'm speaking to people, you're gracing me. You're giving me favor with people who I shouldn't have favor for the sake of your kingdom. You're giving me words to pray in impossible situations. You're giving me boldness when I know my life might be on the line to share what... I know you want me to share. Don't get this confused. This grace is not a genie. You're not Aladdin, why he sings you into the town so you go pick up your princess. This is God allowing you to live out the life he's called you to for his kingdom purposes and him coming alongside you saying, we're in this together. You have to understand Paul wrote a lot of this stuff while chained to some prison wall. And so we get real transactional sometimes, American Christians. We think, well, I went to church like 15 times. How come this business deal didn't fall through? This isn't what he's talking about. This is him giving you favor. And some of you know, some of you have been in those situations where somebody has a situation like a crazy health thing or, or whatever, and you have no idea what to pray. And you close your eyes and you say, Lord, Lord just give me something to say because there's nothing. I, know what, I don't know what to do. And the Lord somehow graces you with the words that comfort these people. It's a beautiful thing, this grace. You don't have to walk this earth alone. Because honestly, the life God is calling to you is asking you to die to self, which is hard. Is asking you to care about other people, and that can be hard. But he's gracing you. He will grace you in this way as you follow him in your own obedience. It is not transactional. It is God working in and through you. So what is a life amazed by grace? I keep asking this question, are you amazed? Right? Are you pen and teller sitting there going like, yeah, grace, cool, appreciate it. Or are you the people sitting behind them going, what just happened? How is this possible that God can love me this way? Because if this is the posture of your heart, amazement, your life just looks different. Someone who is amazed by grace is quick to repent and does not tolerate sin for the sake of grace. Romans 6, 1 and 2. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in sin? See, to me, this is the definition of what I mean by, do you feel entitled to it, right? You've all seen a kid whose parents never hold them accountable to something, continue to bail them out of situations, and they never learn, and they just abuse their parents who will pay that bail money or will go pick them up when they're in trouble and do all those things, and they just abuse it and abuse it. But so many of us can be that way. Well, if there's this grace, do I just do whatever I want? 
Of course not. If you're amazed by grace, it motivates you towards obedience. Because you're trying to return affection to the grace giver the best way you can because you're amazed. A life amazed by grace is moved to prayer. We want to be with that grace giver. 1 Peter 4, 7. It says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. This is such an interesting passage to me because a lot of times we treat prayer as the means to some sort of end. It's going to be the way I travel to this next place. But the way this passage writes this, prayer is the goal. You being with God is the goal. Be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And in a world that is so distracting... I mean, we can get done in one day because of the computer in our pocket what it took a week to do 10 years ago. And we feel accomplished. We feel like this is good. And I I get it. And I like accomplishing things. But the problem is sometimes we view that prayer time as an inconvenience to me getting those things done. or, Or even worse, as a burden because it's taking me away from getting those things done. But a life amazed by grace wants to get down low before the Lord. And say, I understand that this is the most important thing. I heard a story this week of this woman who took a a few weeks in this cabin all by herself with her Bible, and that's it. Her, God, a Bible for a couple weeks. And people thought it was crazy. But when she came back, she said, I'm having trouble having conversation with normal people because I'm so in love with the Lord. It's like, I really want to love all these people, but where I want to be is in that closet at home, just me and him. Because I gave myself a moment to fall in love with the grace giver. Because I'm amazed. And thirdly, person who is amazed by grace extends grace to others. Tim hit this a little bit last week, but I am uh, concerned about where our culture is in a lot of ways uh, in how we treat each other with any sort of difference of opinion. How do we learn to extend grace to others? See, if you're amazed by grace, You want to extend that grace. Just like, I've been forgiven so I can forgive. I've been graced so I can extend that grace. And you know, here, our main saying, it's on our t-shirts, you see it everywhere, is your story matters. And this is vitally important. Because each one of you, myself included, we are an equation of our circumstances, our choices, our victories, our defeats, and what has led us to this moment is a whole bunch of complicated stuff. But still, we all know that. We all say, yeah, that's true. But if we see somebody we don't know, we make assumptions. We almost write a backstory about who they are by the way they look or the things we see them doing. And this is probably a survival thing we developed a long time ago. Don't hang out with that person. It might hurt you, Right? But now, that's not the case. Now we use it just in judgment until we're proven wrong. I thought they were this way, but I've been so convicted of this. And I would tell you some of the stories, but they're honestly embarrassing. And I didn't even realize I was writing some of these backstories until somebody started telling me their story, and then I sat there and went, I am so wrong about this. And my heart broke for them instead of standing in judgment. I was listening to a pastor talking about the need for criminal justice reform a while back, and he messed me up, I'm going to be honest, in this area in particular. He said, a young girl whose parents are drug addicts begin to sell her on the street to pay for their habit. Soon it gets so bad that they just sell her completely. She's hooked on drugs so that she won't fight back as much. She's been in this life for years. And you know what happens on her 18th birthday? She's no longer a victim. She's a criminal. 
We see her walk in the street, and we write some story that says, God, you made some bad choices to get there. She didn't even have a choice. This is true for so many people. How do we look at them with grace? And so many of us, we were born with a great blessing, and that is a compass, a parent who said, this is the way to Christ. This is the way. And you might have gone crazy sideways on all these things, but you came back to that at some point, which was what put you here or put you listening to this online. There are people who are born with none of that. Nobody pushing them in the right direction. So how do we grace them? I don't know if you saw this story. It was in the news for a while. It's the, this group of nuns called uh, Little Sisters of the Poor. And uh, they were in court for a while because of a health care law that said they had to provide birth control to their employees. And they said, we can't do that. That's against what we believe. They're all nuns, right? And so they were recently in the Supreme Court. Uh, they won. And they said they don't have to do that. And the, on the, they were interviewed on the news. And they interviewed the head nun. And they said, uh, so what are you going to do now? And she kind of was a little confused. And she said, okay, we're going to do what we always do. She reads their mission statement. Our mission is to offer the neediest elderly of every race and religion a home where they will be welcomed as Christ, cared for as a family, and accompanied with dignity until God calls them to himself. We will offer the neediest elderly of every race and religion a home where they will be welcomed as Christ. When she said that, welcomed as Christ, I went, Oh, dang, I know that verse. That's Matthew 25, right? Whatever you've done to the least of these, they're sitting with elderly people who are dying and they got nobody and they're just sitting there. And in Matthew 25, when Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of these, whatever you do to these people who have, you have nothing to gain by serving them. Whatever, I was naked and you, you gave me clothes. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was hungry. You fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. This is what you've done unto me. And I think possibly, I'll ask it as a question. Do we as American evangelicals, are we more comfortable being Jesus to strangers than treating them as Christ? We love saying, I'm going to go be the hands and feet Which is a great thing. Go serve. Go do these things. It is good. But sometimes it can get confused because there's some payoff for you. I led five people to the Lord. Dude, that's great. Come here. I walked them through the prayer. Oh, that's awesome. Good for you. And it is good. But we can get lost in it. Can you sit at somebody's feet? It absolutely doesn't benefit you. Treat them as Christ. And we're in such a bitter time where you can't have a relationship with somebody you disagree with. Not even over a biblical matter or whatever, but even if it is biblical. These are crazy, crazy times. And um, social media is a huge problem. We're not going to harp on this too long. (laughs) But if you, I feel like I hit it every time. I, I don't, I'm not on social media. I gave it up a couple years ago. Honestly, I didn't do it much before then. It wasn't a sacrifice for me. Um, But if you haven't watched that Social Dilemma uh, documentary on Netflix, you should. It's scary. And you know what they do, which I never, I always thought, our world is dangerous because we're filtering everything down to our own idea, and it makes us feel right. What I learned from watching that is that's what they're doing to keep you on. And it's far more nefarious than throwing you a whole bunch of things you disagree with that might challenge your thought process. It's saying, hey, you're right, you're right, you're right. And so you no longer have other people, you have enemies. And it's just constantly twisting our brain just a little farther and a little farther. And we're even, we're just unaware of it. So be careful, okay? And even if you are right, okay, even if you are right, say, you, I've got this research, this is exactly what's happening. Truth without love is brutality. What's your goal? 
do you want to see the person you're talking with fully alive with Christ, or do you want to see them agree with you? I've received this grace. I'm going to be graceful. Allow ourselves to be challenged. And, you know, I even think people say, but, but they're on the other side. They're my enemy. Well, I, I wish Jesus said something about that. Oh, no, he did. Right? Love your enemies. Because the picture is so much bigger <laughs> than we allow it to be. We get so cornered and narrow and with blinders on, wanting to win as opposed to really enter into the ministry of reconciliation that Paul talks about, of just bringing some over, somebody over and saying, look, this is Jesus. I want you to know him. He has radically changed my life, and he will change yours. I can't do that. It's not me. And he doesn't even need me to do it, but he allows me to be part of it. Let's be amazed by grace. You know, people who are amazed by grace they really change the world. If you think about John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, and if you don't know his story, this is the snapshot. Slave boat captain, boat almost sinks. God meets him in that moment, ends up becoming a pastor, writing the most well-known gospel song of all time to a slave melody in scale. As a musician, I would tell you, hey, that, that's a pentatonic scale. It was called a slave scale a long time ago. It's the scale that is used in most, in most African countries. And so what he probably heard being sung from the bowels of his ship moved him to a place of being amazed by grace, penning this song that has brought so many people to the Lord, brought an amazement of grace. And even now, the song is still being written by people amazed by grace. This is a band called Need to Breathe. Um, and they've write, written a song recently. It just messes me up. And if I don't get through this quote, I apologize. <laughs> one day I'd love to sing it for you. I don't know if that will happen. But this is one little section. While I'm on this road, you take my hand. Somehow you really love who I really am. I push you away. Still you won't let go. You grow your roses on my barren soul. This is the gift of grace. I'm totally unworthy of this. And you call me in and you don't just say, all right, come on, we'll, we'll let you into heaven. You say, I want to see you thrive. I want to see you be a part of this. Will you be amazed by grace? Do not let what is absolutely unbelievable and amazing become normal. We must live a life that remembers, that continually goes back. And as you see God move on you, writing down, that's why one of the reasons journaling is so important. You can go back and say, look what God did right here. Look how he arranged these things to remain amazed because if you're not looking, it's going to, the most miraculous will become mundane. The ultimate proof, read Exodus. These Israelites saved. They, they're seeing amazing things, right? They see these plagues come in. The, you know, the Lord skips over their house in this terrible plague. They see the, they walk through the sea on dry land. What happens after they're being fed from the sky? <laughs> they go, I'm kind of tired of this. Let's build a cow and worship that. They forgot. And this happens over and over and over again in the Bible. How will you remember? How will you stay amazed? We're going to move into a time of prayer and worship and communion. And this is my encouragement to you. If you've never experienced the grace of God, this might seem like a crazy talk to you. Let today be the day that you experience it. We want to pray with you. There'll be somebody up here who will pray with you. For many of us, I hope our prayer is, God, restore a passion in me, a fire, God, that I once knew and a deeper understanding of just how undeserving I am. 
of the affection that you've poured out. Alone my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way and let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Now ash was redeemed, only beauty remained And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me my chains, I'm a prisoner no more, my shame was a ransom you faithfully bore, he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Yeah. 